Welcome to the Period Story Podcast, the podcast where we get behind some of the myths and misconceptions about periods. We chat with women about their period story, their first period, their journey ever since, and we open up a conversation to help break taboos and stigmas around menstruation. I'm your host, Denise Brothers. I'm a yoga teacher and registered nutritionist specializing in women's health, hormones, and the menstrual cycle. I'm also the author of You Can Have a Better Period, the book Publishers Weekly calls an empowering debut, an informative, refreshing take on women's health. It's available from Amazon, Bookshop, and anywhere else you purchase books. Welcome to today's guest. I'm so pleased to share my conversation with Cherie Hager. Cherie is the co-founder and CEO of Salt, a woman-owned period care company aiming to modernize reusable period care. In 2018, Salt launched its flagship product, the Salt Period Cup, with the vision of making cleaner, more sustainable period care accessible to everyone. Now, in their fourth year of business, Salt has donated over 20,000 cups in 34 countries. A quick note on today's show, we recorded this early last year, so please check the SALT website for the most up-to-date information about the product. Unfortunately, there were a few issues with audio in this episode, so please check periodstorypod.com for a full manuscript of my conversation with Shuri. On today's episode of Period Story, we have Shuri Hager, the founder of SALT Menstrual Cups. I'm so excited to have her on the show today. I am a huge fan of the cups, a huge advocate. So I'm really excited to dive into her story and find out what inspired her to found the brand. But firstly, hear her period story. So this is a question I always ask my guests to begin with. Can you tell me the story of your very first period? So I grew up with an Argentine mother and she was very street savvy, very straightforward. She taught me a lot about periods. So I feel lucky to have known a lot more than I think most girls my age. And to be honest, I can't remember my first period. <laughs> and I think it's this indication that it was a pretty smooth experience for me because I was so knowledgeable. So I feel really grateful to be able to have had that experience. But I also felt more prepared than most girls, you know, my age. Um, but I you know, never loved my period. Regardless, I remember struggling with it, and feeling embarrassed about certain situations and experiencing, you know, what so many others do, bleeding through their pants when their period comes early or having a tampon leak through their underwear or having these terrible cramps during school. When you said that you felt more prepared than others, tell, tell me more about what made you feel more prepared. It was just the knowledge yeah. and confidence that I had someone walking me through and, you know, granted, there was so much I still didn't know, but the fact that she took time to prepare me beforehand, it wasn't something that just surprised me in my underwear one day. Um, I was just really grateful for my mom for you know, being proactive. So your mom prepared you and you felt more confident. You felt um, like you were more in control about what was happening to you. What about in school? How did you learn about periods, uh, say in health class or from your teachers? Yeah, so I had classes just like um, most do in American schools here, where we they had a class where they pull you inside. It was funded by Tampax or Playtex, and they introduced you to tampons for the first time my mom attended. Um, I think it was overall a good experience for me, but of course I was introduced to disposables right away. Reusables just wasn't something that was even in schools and, and very little taught in schools right now as well. That's something that I hope to change. So, but of course, it was embarrassing being there with with so many peers and learning about periods, you know, for the first time. And and you know, everyone just struggles with those with those same stigmas and that hush hush period talk. That's still a problem today. Why do you think it was embarrassing? You know, looking at what I know about periods now, I'm ashamed to say that I was embarrassed. But I just think that it's a reality for so many women and girls all across the world. And it's because of those learned stigmas that we learn in society, that we learn from, you know, our male colleagues and our, you know, male peers and also our female peers. And, you know, even my, even my mom would tell me, hey, hide your tampon. Up. And so it was, it was still very much causing that shame. So that you, you went through high school hiding your tampons, 
feeling like this was something that had to be hidden. Yes, very much so. How old were you when you got your first period? Um, I believe that I was 13 years old. Yeah. And when you got your first period, you felt really confident. And then how how was it actually having your period going through high school? Was it painful? Was it heavy? And how did you navigate that? So I use primarily tampons and I have, you know, a regular to heavy flow. And despite feeling prepared for my period, it didn't mean that I had good feelings. To work, and it didn't mean that I was really knowledgeable about it. It would still surprise me all the time. And I was very active in high school. So I did dance, I did gymnastics, even taught a Brazilian martial art called capoeira. And, you know, we're, we're wearing white pants, we're wearing short tear skirts. And I remember always being concerned. So he would wear liners and sometimes it would surprise me and I'd have those embarrassing moments. And I, I think it's unfortunate that so many white girls live with those fear moments, live with that lack of confidence every single month, not knowing, you know, when their period can arrive. So I'm so grateful that we have better solutions out there. Mm. But it just it causes that shame, that stigma. And it's so sad to see that, especially in young girls, how they it's instilled in such a and knowing that you had there was a stigma that around periods and menstrual health for you. Thinking about where you are now, what have you done to change your attitude towards periods and kind of release the stigma around it? That's a great question. It's interesting because as a business owner entrenched in the menstrual health industry, I think people expect that I must have gotten, you know, to get into this industry because I was an expert, but that's simply not the case. I'm an average woman who loved menstrual cups and wanted to get the word out to the consumer. And we knew when we started SALT that we were going to battle these long-held stigmas around periods that presented both our greatest challenge and our opportunity. So from the outset, we knew we were entering this product category, still really taboo for a lot of people. So we took that stigma head on with beautiful high-end packaging that looked like, you know, uh, unboxing a beautiful lipstick. And we wanted to, to be able to be a clean personal care product that sat on the same shelves as other clean beauty products. We wanted it to be seen as something that was sustainable and healthier and more comfortable. And so we were able to battle a lot of those stigmas by just how we presented our brand, our imagery, voice. And we try to do that same thing with just periods in general, is get out this messaging to the mainstream consumer that periods don't have to be considered gross or something that, um, something that should be shameful or hidden. They're beautiful. This is 50% of the population that menstruates. And it perpetuates the human rights. We just we think that deserves kudos, not censorship. And so we actually just released a brand campaign that's all about flipping the script, the negative script uh, about periods and turning it into something positive and showing it as, you know, divine and something beautiful and something powerful, powerful like the cycles of the earth. It shows a woman and it shows the cycles of the earth and it shows that same power and that same correlation. And uh, we've gotten a lot of great feedback because we're really trying to take a, a head on and change it. In fact, I really have a pet peeve in the industry. <laughs> okay. And that, that is those ads that show women, you know, dressed up, personified in red, sometimes mm. in, a, in a hazmat suit because their boyfriend is coming for the weekend and it's showing periods as an annoyance and gross. And I just think, really? Are those the messages that we want our daughters to see, that we want this next generation to see to inform how they feel about periods? And I really believe that type of messaging is damaging to help only perpetuate the stigma around them. Mm. I have five daughters, so I'm a mother of five. And I don't want my daughters or any young person to grow up being degraded by those same stigmas that past generations had to endure. So it's it's something that we're really trying to combat head on. So you have you have five daughters. Talk to me about how you've been teaching them about periods and menstrual health and taking out some of the stigma that you felt towards your period. So I try to tell them that as menstruators, we're the ones who set the cues for how other people feel about having a conversation around periods. So number one, I tell them to be open. You know, when my daughter's on her period, she says, oh, I don't even want my sisters. Then that's just perpetuating stigma. Talk about it when you're on your period. You can be, you can have open conversations. If anything in our household, it should be something very welcome. And yet it's interesting to see her still struggle. She's 13 years old, my oldest is, and her um, still struggle with those stigmas that she gets from, from school and from society in general. 
but I've taught her to have those open conversations and that that's the way we can progress forward as women. So, and as menstruators. So I tell her to the way that she speaks about periods and as straightforward as she can be, those are the cues that her counterparts, her peers are going to see. So if we feel awkward, then they're going to feel awkward. If we feel open, they're going to feel open and they're going to be fine. having. Them. I also like to tell her about how her anatomy works. Like for instance, there was um, a lot that I wish I knew back then about just cervix height. And she uses a cup, of course. So I taught her how to use, how to use a cup and knowing your cervix height is really integral to using a cup. And also that, you know, menstrual. The menstrual cycle has four phases. You have your menstrual, your follicular, your ovulation, your luteal phase. And I think there's a lot of perception that those PMS symptoms happen, you know, just during your period, your bleeding phase, Hmm. when in reality, as you know, they happen two weeks prior in that luteal phase. That's when you actually experience most of this. So just teaching her how her hormones are affecting her moods and how it's very natural in the cycle uh, brings awareness to her. So she understands her body. feeling and she's able to uh, you know make better choices and really focus on her health because of that so do you feel like she because sometimes with teenagers teenage girls and I I don't have a teenage daughter but I'm speaking from my own experience where your mom tells you something and you kind of you kind of poo-poo it because it's your mom do you think she's taking on board what you're saying that's a great question so when I uh, first cup, so she helped us develop our teen cup. We wanted to make sure that it was a good size for a 13 year old. So she helped to test it. But at first, she didn't want to. She wanted to try tampons first. And it was so funny. I said, Your mom owns a menstrual care, you know, menstrual cup business. You need to use a cup for the first time. <laughs> but of course, when she tried tampon, I was going to be supportive. I said, That's fine. Um, when you're ready to switch to a cup, then, you know, let me know and you can take that jump. And she did. She tried it on her own. She didn't tell me when she did, because you're right. They don't always want to listen to what mom said. <laughs> but uh, I had a, a moment, a moment of celebration when she came to me and said, Mom, I tried the cup. I don't know why more people don't use the cup. It was so much better, and so much cleaner. I love it so much more. And I just we wanted to jump for joy and said, yes, <laughs> if I can convert my own daughter, then other teens can also enjoy the cup. And it's interesting because our teen cup is a lot smaller than our, you know, regular flow cup. And since within the same two months, you know, her next cycle is to our regular size. So it really was just uh, just getting over that first hurdle. So I want to come back to um, the cup and the business um, a little bit later on. But I want to kind of r- rewind a little bit to find out more about your menstrual health journey. So you did you always have periods that were just that were heavy uh or you said you use a medium to light cup so did you always have periods that were kind of the same as you went from your teens to your 20s i actually consider myself very regular very regular in what how my periods come i've only like missed one period my entire life during a moment of stress and that was that was interesting and very telling to see where I was at. But otherwise, very much like clockwork, and I am that regular to heavy flow, pretty regularly from high school. Um, the the one thing I've noticed is I have had a decrease over time. I think part of that is because of the cup. But I remember when I was younger, I would have terrible cramps. I remember traveling to Hawaii once, and because of the humidity and the and change, because I live in a desert area, it really just magnified the and. I remember staying in our hotel room. I went in the closet and like just sat in the fetal position while everyone is at the beach. My mom came and found me and she was so mad that I didn't ask for a Tylenol. Um, again, that speaks to that shame. I, I was, I didn't want my brothers to know. I grew up with four brothers. I didn't want them to know I was on my period because sometimes I would be mocked a lot by my older brothers. When I was on there. So, so yes, um, I, I feel like that has changed a little bit over time, mostly in cramping. But my flow is made pretty consistent. Did you use a mixture of pads and tampons when you were younger? Yeah, you said. Yeah, you- I started at the very beginning. I started, I started with pads. I moved to tampons very quickly. But as you know, uh, tampons often leak through, especially with the heavy flow and being as active as I was. I couldn't always go change the tampon really quickly, and so I would always wear a liner. And what was the light bulb moment for you? when you realized that actually 
that those weren't the products that you wanted to be using? So I didn't discover the menstrual cup until a lot later in life. It was about eight years ago. And I think this is the case for a lot of people. The cup mm. was invented in the 1930s. And people are always shocked to hear that. It was invented by a rubber cup. But the design was very much very similar to the cups that you see on the market today. And um, I just think that because there's these big disposable conglomerates that you know make a lot more profit for disposable products, they were pushed quite a bit more. So menstrual cups have really just made a comeback in more recent years and since that day. And a lot of people still don't know what it is. So, so it was about eight years ago when I was introduced to cup. And um, the story is I had been talking to my aunt in Venezuela and the situation there is very dire. They struggle to get anything on the shelves, you know, food and diapers, let alone things like pads. So I thought of my five daughters and what I would do in that situation. And that dependence we had on disposable really kept me up at night. So I looked at what other reusable options there were out there. And that's when I was first in extra cup. And I learned that it was cleaner and it was non-toxic and it lasted, you know, 10 years and you could, you know, wear it for 12 hours. And I just thought, where has this been my whole life? So I tried several cups. I, I tried several different cups out there. Um, and I just couldn't find one that fit my anatomy and one that I felt was ideal to be able to share with my friends, something ideal for beginners. And that's when I roped my husband into helping me custom design a cup that I felt would be great for the mainstream consumer, great for beginners, and one that would be made of high quality silicone that didn't contain fillers like you have over, but was US made, US sourced. And you know, that, that's kind of what started the salt journey. What I really love about the salt cup, and this is listeners, this isn't an advert. I just like, you know, I'm an, I, I talk about the products that I love. But what I love about the salt cup is that it's soft. And I've used other brands that it's much harder and, you know, it's, you have to fold it. So it is malleable, but it is, it is harder. And I personally started using the salt cup two menstrual cycles ago. And I actually see a difference in my period. And I, what I love is that you do, you have that quiz to see the cervix size and the cups are soft. And, and I used to get this kind of suction feeling, um, like a deep suction feeling when I used to cut the old cup that I used to use. And I don't get that anymore. And it actually has reduced the period pain that I was experiencing where it's just kind of, I've been amazed by it. Absolutely amazed. So tell me how you realized that the softer cup was better um, and that you needed to pay more attention to kind of cervical size in order for this to be the best product for people who menstruate. Yeah, first first I'll say that we have a Salt Cup Academy. It's a private group on Facebook and it's made up of 25,000 women who are Salt Cup users. And they've said over and over again, your same experience, similar experiences that when they've tried the cup, it's less than camping. And it's, you know, less pressure and it's just a better, more comfortable period of experience than other products. So that's so great to hear. I love hearing how much you love the cup. Um, we did set out to make a cup that was best for me. And we have two varieties. And it sounds like you might use our softer cup. Yeah. Because we have one that's an original. Yep. We have one that's an original for a mist. That one is one we do recommend for beginners because it pops open and stays open. But many people do change to our softer cup over time. I use a soft cup. It's a little bit more of a manual open, but um, it stays in very well. It's very comfortable. You forget that it's even there. And, you know, what we learn um, is a lot of it has to do with the finish on the cup. Our cups go through this process called cryogenic deflashing. So after they're made in the liquid injection mold, they go into this tumbler that is cooled with liquid nitrogen. And they have uh, silicone beads that are blasted all around the cup. And what it does is it creates a super smooth finish. And so there's no seams. Like you, it, it looks virtually steam, but it's part of that cryogenic deflashing process that makes so kind of soft. The other thing is that it has a very flexible stem that doesn't have any of those grip rings that can be really irritable, you know, especially around the vaginal labia. And so we created a stem that was very soft and flexible so that it, you know, wouldn't irritate and people wouldn't have to cut it off. 
people mm. used to cut off their stems all the time because they would say it's uncomfortable. And I said, you know, why not create a cup that you don't have to cut the stem off? So that was that was a little bit of a design change that people appreciated. So I'm glad to hear that it was okay. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. So for listeners who are hearing what you're saying, they're interested in trying a menstrual cup, but they're a little bit nervous. That's something I hear all the time. There, I had a conversation with a client uh, a couple of weeks ago who she said, I want to try it, but I'm just nervous. I'm nervous about the spilling. I'm nervous about the mess. How would you recommend that someone who's feeling like that starts? So number one, everyone is nervous. <laughs> it's a big behavior change. We're asking you to take a big jump from something that's really convenient, like disposables, to something else that's convenient, but reusable that you can wash and to be able to make that mental switch. So we like to say that it only takes one moment of bravery. Whether you're in the shower, shower is a great risk-free zone to try a cup. Um, but also to find a friend who uses a cup or to look to an influencer that uses a cup. We have great uh, customer service team that's really dedicated that will help you, you know, literally hold your through the entire process. Um, we found early on that for those that were scared you know, to use a cup, we have a hashtag called Pass the Salt. And it's because it's a very word of mouth type of product. You need to hear it from a trusted friend or a trusted source or a mentor like an answer who can kind of tell about their experience and um, kind of lose some of that fear factor. And the fear factor is just there for everyone. So we say, take the leap, take that one moment of bravery, put the cup outside your shower. And when you're ready to try it, you can do it before your period. If you want to take a dry run and just put it in and take it out. But uh, it's not that scary. It does have a learning curve. So we like to set those expectations that it's not going to be something that's going to, you're going to catch on really quickly. Although there's a lot of women who do, they put it in and they figure it out very fast, but go with expectation that, that there will be a learning curve. It may take two to three cycles to really get you to, to make sure you're not leaking your position correctly. But when you do, you have thousands of cup supporters who are just cheering you on because you're making products, you're making the switch to be more comfortable, that's better for you and less toxic. I, that's actually the thing that I've noticed about menstrual cup users is that they're really big advocates for the product. And once they find one that they love, they will just cheer, cheer anyone on who uses it, recommend that brand. And it's much more so than tampons and pads. And actually this, I found the same for period underwear. People, they just love them and they'll just, you know, really really cheer on their favorite brand. I want to talk about, there's tends to be kind of different benefits that users will focus on when they, when it comes to menstrual cups, it's either the environmental side, it's the, the idea of the hormone support or the potential of having less painful periods. And then there's also the economic side I know you started the company because you were wanted to find you were trying to find a reusable solution. Um, but w- what about the hormonal and the um, economic side of of the menstrual product? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it certainly is a money saver when you invest in a cup because it can last ten years. We like to say it lasts just as long as your passport <laughs> and gives those dividends over and over again. Um, it can save users, you know, between fifteen hundred to you know two thousand dollars over its 10, 10 year life. Um, it depends on how many pads and tampons and what you're buying. But so it certainly can save thousands of dollars to spend on something, you know, more fun than tampons, chocolate, travel, and so forth. Um, and so especially during this pandemic time, that's been a big driver. We have very large just interest in reusables in general. We also have a period underwear line that we came out with in November. And so for both our period underwear and our cup together, because it's such a perfect pairing for sustainability and to have a period it's in a big pandemic and because everyone's at home. And so it's a risk-free time to try it out. And then as far as, you know, hormonal, like I said, there's been many users that report that they have less cramping and, you know, that it's, it's really helpful. I think it's just anecdotal evidence. I can't, I can't, you know, promise that that's going to be the case, but we have seen it over you know, tampons also create that environment where there's a lot of micro tearing mm. um, when you're pulling out a dry tampon, which increases the risk of TSS. Mm. And so menstrual cups doesn't mitigate the risk of TSS overall because you can use 
can get TSS with any insert product or strip up, but it's vastly lower than something like a tampon because it just doesn't create that same environment of um, that, you know, just has that, you know, humidity and then that moisture together with, you know, the little rayon fibers that are often found in tampons, mm. even fiber. And so it's, it's just a healthier option. Yeah, definitely. And for listeners who aren't aware, TSS, TSS is toxic shock syndrome. And that's when you have, you know, if you've been wearing the tampon for longer than the recommended time, it can, it can create kind of like a, a, an infection that sends you to hospital. So shifting gears to the kind of entrepreneurial side of your story, you founded a company um, in February 2018. You've been running a company that is sustainable, uh, helping users find uh, economic value as well. Talk to us a little bit about your journey as an entrepreneur um, and also running this business with a very, well, in my view, a large family. <laughs> it is a large family. Five children is large. And it, I feel I feel lucky every day that I have five daughters, because, um, especially, you know, for my husband as well. We're really working to create a life for them and and change lives everywhere where take away the barriers that are created frustration. Um, and I'm going to talk about our impact efforts a little bit, and then I'll go on to our story. But from day one, we knew that we wanted to become a B Corp and we wanted to have a philanthropic and dedicate 2% of our revenue to help improve menstrual health and also sustainability efforts in girls. And a lot of people don't realize just how tied girls and like, you know, for instance, in Uganda, primary school, and then you see it drop 22% you say, what happened, right? It's period, periods happen. It's as soon as girls hit puberty, school dropout rates just start to skyrocket. So if we could create this cup, this little investment in a cup um, and get it to girls so that they have a long-term solution for period care, then suddenly we're creating economic opportunity. We're getting girls in school. We're helping women work. And we're literally breaking cycles of poverty. So it's just something that really drives us every day. We're and, you know, one of our internal goals is to help 100 million lives, 100 million women and girls be able to live more authentic lives. And, you know, we're well on our way for that. So that was an, a, a driver right from the beginning. I think that you need a strong why as an entrepreneur because there's so many ups and downs. And to be able to push through and say, no, this, pro- this product can change so many lives. It's a game change um, is what really motivates us and keeps us going every day. So we did. We developed the product. Um, it was a big jump as an entrepreneur to decide to pull the trigger. For instance, we started with just our small and our regular cup and the mold itself was a $25,000 investment for one size. So 50,000 for two sizes. And that's because you're literally etching it in steel. So we had to be very confident in our mold that it was going to be a product that was going to work well for people. It's hard when you don't have the opportunity to have them wear test. So we went through 14 different design iterations. We pulled the trigger, created these molds, and we had a focus group of a thousand people that we had garnered over time that we would ask all sorts of questions to. You know, what do you like about our branding? Do you like this cup color better? You know, what are you looking for in a reasonable product? Um, what kind of voice do you like? One that's more authoritative or one that's more approachable? And we'd A/B test these questions to that group. And then when it was time to launch, we gave them each a free cup. We wanted them to film their unboxing experience, so they did that on social media. And it really helped catapult the brand and have these. So when we launched a website, it wasn't just crickets, but we had a, a team of a thousand ambassadors who really believed in the product, believed in our brand, and excited to be able to share. So that was part of our journey. And then uh, I would say our next big milestone was when we launched in all Target stores nationwide. And that was just huge to be able to do that in our second year. And that was due to our beautiful branding. She said straight up that she felt that our brand would be best positioned to take the cup mainstream because of the presented our products and the education. It was a very validating. I, what I love about what you said, uh, you said this earlier, is that you didn't want it to be a kind of typical menstrual product brand. You want it to be more of a kind of clean, clean beauty sort of brand. And I see that in the branding. It looks, it looks very stylish. It looks like something 
you could throw in your basket and you wouldn't, not that I would hide it, but you know, you could imagine some people hiding those sorts of things and you don't, you don't need to. And I think that's very appealing to a lot of people who aren't necessarily as far as we are in our menstrual health journey. Now you're, you're launching in the UK. You have launched or you're about to launch in the UK? Yeah, we do. We do have a free PL in the UK. So products yeah. are there. Yeah. And you can purchase off our off our website. We're also on Amazon UK. And then we're in a couple small retailers there. And we're looking to continue to grow our footprint. A period underwear is not in the UK yet. You can buy it off our website. We'll be shipped there, but we're hoping to have it there soon. Okay, great. And so you are so you're now international as a brand. Great. Fantastic. Um, so thinking about everything that you've learned over th- your journey as through your period and then as an entrepreneur what is the one message you would want to leave people with who are on this kind of similar entrepreneurial journey where they have a vision they have an idea but they're unsure about whether or not they should pull the pull the trigger what what would you say to them i would say that more and more people want to align with companies that represent their own values and that align with your values. So I'm a big believer in social enterprise. I love the B Corp movement because I believe that it um, encompasses the best of both worlds, the nonprofit and the for-profit industry. So for those that are looking at between entrepreneurs pulling the trigger on a product that they want to create or a brand that they want to develop, I would look into social enterprise and see how you can use your business to do good in the Use your business as a force for I think that there's so much that every business can do to empower their workers, to be able to look as B Corps do at not just the bottom line and profit, but taking that triple bottom line approach and looking at people, planet, and profit, which includes your community, and includes your customers, and includes your suppliers and the factories that you work with. Looking at doing everything you do in a clean ethical way that's both good for your customers, good for people, and for the planet. So I, I'm just such a big believer. I think the trend is going to continue to show that those that have a uh, social mission are the brands that are going to grow and the brands that the millennials, Gen Zers are going to grow. Fantastic. I love that idea of having a social, a social mission. And I definitely see that resonating with a lot of people versus companies who, you know, we can all think of big ones that are purely, as you see it, focused on on profit. If someone wants to buy a menstrual cup, they've heard our conversation today. They want they want to dive in. How can they find find the the salt menstrual cups? The easiest way is checking our website salt.com. Like I said, we're also sold on Amazon. We're sold on various retailers nationwide: Target, REI, Free People, Whole Foods. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today, sharing your period story. And um, yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Lonnie. It's been such a pleasure. For more inspiring conversations, head over to periodstorypod.com where we have so many more for you to peruse. If you want help with your menstrual or hormone health, email me on hello at eatlovemove.com to set up a free 30-minute hormone health review. If you like today's show, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Tag us, come say hi, and send in your requests for who you'd like to see on the show on Instagram and Twitter on at periodstorypod or email us at hello at periodstorypod.com. I'm Lenise Brothers, and you've been listening to Period Story. Thank you so much for listening.